Okay, let's get started. Uh, hi everyone, welcome. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, I got a lot of slides, so I'm gonna get running all the time, and I have a timer running here that stresses me out. So. Uh, my name is Eric, uh, I'm from Sweden. I'm gonna talk to you about Kotlin coroutines, uh, how you use it on Android, and cats, mostly cats. So let's get started. Um, async is hard. Anyone here who does Android and does anything that's beyond running on the main thread knows that loading data, running stuff in the background, whatever it is, if it's go talking to the network, or talking to your database, it's, it's easy to get wrong and there are so many pitfalls. So we've tried for a while to, to fix that, but you know, the reason this is hard is because we suck at multitasking. We're, we're horrible at it. Like anyone claims they're good at multitasking is probably have a very good self-confidence, but you know, most of us are really bad at it. So, like, I, my cat jumps up in my lap, I can't work anymore. So, two things. Fails even then. Um, so, we're gonna look at this code. I'm gonna get back to this one during the whole talk, so we'll cover it properly. We have one function, load tweets. It needs to run in the background. It does an IO operation, so we can't run it on the main thread or it will crash. Uh, it returns a list of tweets. Then we have the method show tweets that will, oh, I see I may have made a, no, sorry, show tweets uh, that takes the result and displays it. And this one needs to run on the UI thread because it modifies the UI. So they need to run on different threads. And okay, so when we started with Android, we had this wonderful async task. Anyone here still using it? Good. Well, shame on you. <laughs> Um, it's a it's little bit, it, it gets the job done, but it's a little bit cumbersome. It doesn't have proper error handling. Um, there's cancellation issues, and there's all kinds of issues with this one. Um, so, yeah, so over the years, we came up with new solutions, and like over the last couple of years, the, the thing we have been doing is Rx a lot. Like a lot of people embrace that one as the solution to this. And, Rx is great. It is still, it doesn't get uh, invalid with coroutines, as I'm gonna get back to. Uh, but it, there is a lot of things. Here I'm just making a simple network call, and then I want to do, show it on the UI, and there's a lot of things here that's not related to that. So it's, for instance, there is error handling needs to be added, and that requires another uh, function callback being added. Um, we need to explicitly say that this should run on the background thread. We need to explicitly say that after that, we go back to the main thread. And, well, we have two function calls that happen here, so uh, it's that as well. And then finally, we need to remember to dispose or cancel this one once we're done or when, it's, when the activity goes out of scope and gets destroyed. So there is lots of things to think about. So can we maybe make this easier so that anyone who wants to make, like, loading data or running things in the background doesn't have to think about all these things. Could we maybe simplify it? And that's what we're gonna do today. So what we would like to have is something like this. You just call, load tweets, send in the query there, and you get the list of tweets, and then show it on the UI. You don't, shouldn't really have to care about what thread you're running on, right? Okay, we can't have this. Like, exactly this doesn't work. But we can't have this. So this is what we're gonna do today. We're gonna see how we can create a DSL where we have a like, nice syntax, easy to read, easy to understand, doesn't make it too complicated. We don't have to think about the threads explicitly. So, stay tuned. So coroutines, the easiest way to explain it is to say it's a state machine and then you have a queue. That's coroutines, right? Everyone got it now? My cat did the same thing. It's like trying to explain it that way, but it didn't really work. Let's try a different analogy. You're all Android developers, so you've seen this. We all love it. We use this all the time to talk about Android. Uh, but I'm going to use it like now to explain what a coroutine are. So an activity has a state it, when it gets stopped or destroyed. It can have a state, it can save it down there, uh, and it can get resumed from that state later on. So we have these two important methods. We have the onCreate, which maybe have a state it, it gets recreated from, 
and we have the on save instance state, which where you can save some custom state information. By default, it saves the whole view hierarchy as uh, uh, the state for that one for you. So if you take this thing here, we think of the activity as a process, like that's a thing that's running, that's happening, that's run doing something. We think of the bundle in the save instance state as the state of the process when it gets suspended, stopped, destroyed, whatever. Take these two and just map them to the coroutine concepts. So an activity, think of that as a coroutine. It's something that can be started, can be running, and at any time it can just be stopped and destroyed. Fortunately, thanks to something called continuation, it can stop, save this state here and resume it at the same point later on. That's the easiest way to think about coroutines. Now, coroutines relate to threading and stuff like that as well when we use them, but this is the easiest way to explain them. Don't think about threads and stuff like that. That comes later. Continuation, that was something new. Anyone here seen that before? Well, there is an interface in the coroutine library. Looks like this. It has two functions, important functions here. Resume and resume with exception. It also has a coroutine context. We're going to get back to this one. But now you're asking, what is a coroutine really? What is it really? Well, Donald Knut, one of the founding fathers, fathers of computer science, I'd say, uh, he is also one of the people who came up with coroutines back in early 60s, late 50s, sort of, so some time ago. Uh, he said subroutines are a special case of coroutines. And just replace subroutines with functions, and you get sort of the same thing. So coroutines is more like a general form of thinking of functions. So a coroutine is a function. Important to drink water. That's Lucy. Let's create our first coroutine. So Coroutines are created using coroutine builders, and there are a number of them. We're going to look at a few. Launch is the most basic one. It does exactly what it says. It launches a coroutine. In this case, we launch this, and by default, it will run on a background thread. What? There are threads? Yes, there are still threads. But you can specify which thread it should run on using the context parameter to a coroutine. It has a default one, which will run on a dedicated background thread. But the coroutine co context basically says how to run this, including which thread it will be running on. An interesting thing is a coroutine can run on one thread, get suspended, and run another thread next. OK, so we can use this in our own create method, like this. Just load this one, it will run on the background thread, and you get the result there. Now we can expand this some more, because the nice thing is, um, oh, well, first also, you need to be able to cancel it. So the launch uh, function returns a job, and the job is something you can go, call cancel on. We need that in order to, you know, not update our UI when we got destroyed or something. Uh, but also, another interesting thing is that we can call another coroutine builder inside a coroutine. So if we call launch again, but in this time, we switch context, saying, now you run on the UI. UI here is something that comes from the Android extensions for coroutines. It defines how to run a coroutine on the main thread. So that's nice. So now if we start on the background thread, we load our stuff, we launch another coroutine, we run on the UI thread, and uh, just works. Another nice thing is, because we call cancel on the job that's that we return from the top coroutine builder, it will also cancel the child. Launch looks like this. So let's go through the, this one. Uh, the other coroutine builders are similar. Um, but let's take one thing at a time. So the context is a coroutine context. What thread to run on? It's a little bit more than that, but if you're getting started, you can think of it in that way. Start is another optional parameter. By default, it's... Uh, eagerly started, it starts right away. But you can also set this to lazy, so it's lazily started. And we're going to see later what that means. You can also explicitly specify another job as being the parent of this coroutine. We're going to see examples of that also. 
Usually, when we run a coroutine inside another coroutine, we might specify that, but usually not. And finally, we have the function that we provide. And it, you see here, we have a new thing, suspend. That's a new keyword coming with the coroutine library. Now, there is another coroutine builder called async. So launch doesn't return any, any value. It returns a job that we can cancel, but it doesn't return any value. What if you want a value from a background thread operation? Well, then you need to use async. So async will return a deferred. A deferred is similar to JavaScript's promise or future in Java or you know, all of these um, asynchronous constructs that we have in different languages. So on a deferred, you can take that one and inside another coroutine called await. And now you have a non-blocking waiting operation. So if there is no result, when a wait is called, it will suspend that function and resume it again once there is a result or an exception. So show tweets here running on the main thread will not block the main thread, which is great. Now we call cancel here, and now we don't have a now this uh, launch here is not a child coroutine, but the good thing is that a wait here will throw a cancellation exception so the show tweets won't be, call, be called in case uh, we cancel it. So there are two builders. Uh, the deferred ones is uh, load a, uh, launch a coroutine that returns the deferred value. And fire or forget, that's more what you use for launch. So depending on your use case, you use either of these. Suspended functions. Okay, back to this one again. There are two functions, resume and resume with exception. So when the coroutine gets suspended, this interface is implemented on, your, on that function, or that coroutine that you're running, uh, that, that gets built by this coroutine builder, and it takes the state, save it down there, and when it gets resumed and something is about to happen, it calls one of these methods. So, for example, one of the built-in coroutine func uh, functions, the await one we just saw, looks like this. It's a little bit simplified, the full code is a little bit more than this. But it basically checks if there was an exception that was thrown in the background there, then it passes that one into the resume with exception. Otherwise, it passes a value in. Important to drink water. OK. Let's make a DSL, a domain specific language. I know that there is a talk tomorrow tomorrow afternoon. I really recommend you go to, go to that one. That's about how to write DSLs in, in uh, Kotlin. Um, so if you want to know more about how to do that, I really recommend it. So we're going to make an extension function. We create an extension function called load on the class activity. Now we can call load within any activity. The only parameter we give it first is a loading function, a function that does the actual background work. The function doesn't take any parameter but returns a value of type t. So we start by returning that value here. But now this is a synchronous thing. We can't run this on our main thread if it does any like, blocking operations. So what we do then is just, we just wrap that load function call in an async call. Now we, our load function, that is an extension function on activity, returns a deferred of that type. OK. Let's add another extension function on the deferred class. This time, call it then. This takes a UI function, which takes as a single parameter t, the type that we were interested in, and returns unit. That means like void for Java world. And then we call, inside this one, we call launch. But this time, we pass in the UI context, the coroutine context that so runs on the, on the main thread. And then we call UI function. And this weird this at then. It's just to be explicitly clear that if we're calling a wait on the deferred object that we're calling then on. So, one more change. We add infix to the, the second extension function. You're going to see why. So now we can do this. That's those two functions. That's all it needs to start doing this kind of DSL. Load this, then do this. Runs on the background thread first and then goes over to the main thread. And the one using this API doesn't have to care about those things. Almost there. So 
we need the cancellation. Thankfully, there is something in the architectural components that you hopefully have heard about now that can help us. So we create a lifecycle observer, implementing the lifecycle observer interface, annotating a method on the on-stop uh, uh, event, and we pass in to this class as in the constructor a job. And then we check if the job is cancelled. If it isn't, then we cancel. So this is the first step. Second thing, we go back to these extension functions and we change the first one. Instead of putting the extension function on the activity, we put it on the lifecycle owner. That's a common thing that's implemented both by the, um, the fragment activity and the fragment. So now we have, can call this load function both on a inside a fragment and in an activity. We don't need to call it on one, make two of these functions. It works on both. And the thing we do, we get the deferred that we get from our sync call. We create a coroutine lifecycle listener, pass in this deferred object, and add it as an observer to the lifecycle of that class you're calling this load function on. Now, when your activity or fragment is stopped, this job will be automatically cancelled. Deferred extends job, so that's nice. We don't need to change the other extension function. It works like this. Now, we might want to add more control, so we do like this. We can specify a default coroutine context where we define how many threads should be running here. Uh, and then we can ha have it make the possibility for anyone using our load function to give their own coroutine context. Another thing is that we can say coroutine start lazy, which means it won't be started until we call await on the deferred that is returned from the sync call. Done. That was basically the thing, first thing I, I, I covered there. That, those, this code there that I've shown is all you need to do a synchronous loading with in a much more simpler way in your activities and fragments. What about errors, you're thinking? Here comes a great thing. When we learned how to write Java or programming in general, we learned about exceptions. You do a try and we do a catch. It's kind of nice to remember that, uh, use that one, because now we use Arcs Java, we have two different callbacks. And like, the great thing about coroutines here is you have this continuation here. So it will pass in the exception to whoever uh, gets this value that we're waiting for. This one. This was being used. So if your load, the function you do, uh, you're loading in, throws an exception, this is what gets called. And it will be passed down to whoever is awaiting your call. So in our case, let's say the load tweet throws an exception. Well, then you just catch it there. And it's fine. There is more. <laughs> so you're probably feeling a little bit like exhausted if your is coroutines is new to you. Uh, don't worry. So did my cat. So let's talk about channels. A channel is basically a queue. That's the easiest thing to compare it to. So you can pass in values, and you can get values, and you get them in the order of fashion. You can block on or things. And they work with coroutines. The thing is, you can send, like 10 integers in this case, into the channel. I could extend that for loop and delay each call if I wanted, wanted to. But then we can also read the numbers from the channel in another coroutine. So you, this is a way to pass multiple values between two coroutines. It's really useful, as you're going to see soon. Now, you can also use uh, this, uh, uh, the, the, um, the channel like you do sequence in Kotlin. So you can do filter, and you can do map. And the really cool thing here is that you can take a coroutine context to these operators. Look familiar? Rx, right? Kind of like a different way of doing this. So, so, so this is, uh, you can do similar things as with, uh, with Rx, as with this. You don't have all the Rx operators, of course. Now, let's say you have this. You create a click channel, and we set an on-click listener, and we call launch when you click that one, and we send, in this case, we send in the view. Now, then we repeat. Ten, ti ten times we call create another, we create ten new uh, coroutines on a background thread that does a heavy work here. It just consumes the object. It doesn't care about the view of the object itself. It just spawns ten 
heavy work on 10 different coroutines in the background. So we can have multiple consumers of a channel. And you can also have multiple producers. So you can, if we launch 10 coroutines, producing values and putting them into the same channel, that works fine. Then you can have on the main thread receiving all those. So if you're having a background operation that results in many different events that are going in parallel, you can put them into the same channel, and the channel is then read by the main thread. OK. So the problem that some people face sometimes is that you have a button, and you really, really want to make sure that you prevent double tapping. Even if you disable the button, there is still some edge cases that can happen there, like payment button. You don't want them to click twice. So let's say this. How can you throttle click callbacks? Because in this case, if a user accidentally taps twice, two coroutines will be launched. And this DSL that we just created does not prevent that. So let's see what we can do. Actors. So anyone here used Scala has probably heard of this, worked with it. And now we're going to do the same thing using Kotlin coroutines and the channels. So what you do, we use another coroutine builder called Actor. And in that one, you will have access to a channel object. This channel is a receive channel, the channel that you're reading from. Here, we basically do a map. We specify that this map operation will be done on the common pool, which is a background thread. And there we call load tweets. And then we call consume each. You don't need to specify that you're going back to the UI here, because that will happen automatically. Because the actor, the outer actor, is running on the uh, UI thread. And there you call show tweets and you display it. So we can do this. And then in the on click listener, you call offer instead of send. And offer will drop the event if the receiver is busy. So if show tweets hasn't returned yet and the, it's, it's done processing that event, it won't start calling low tweets before that is done. Exactly what we wanted. Try to explain this to Lucy. Did not work well. They got really confused. And that's fine. It's okay to be confused about this because this is kind of like, it can be a little bit tricky. It took me a while to grasp all of these things. So let's extend our DSL to make using this easier. So we start by creating a new class. We call it loading channel uh, of a certain type. Uh, it takes three parameters. It takes a life cycle, which we need that one for cancellation. Take a view, that will be our button we click on, and it takes a loading function. It also t has a function marked with the infix called then, like the one we did before, that takes a UI function. Now here we create the job. This is our reference for being able to do cancellation because we're going to reuse uh, our coroutine lifecycle listener. The actor function returns a send channel, so we can pass that one into our coroutine lifecycle listener. So, and then we call view set on click listener an offer. And we, in this case, we just use unit, which is void, because we're not interested in the view itself. So we just send a signal to the receiving side. Inside our actor call, we do exactly what we did before. We map to the loading function, and then we consume each of those events and call the UI function. The loading function is a, a member of this class, so that works fine. And thanks to the lifecycle, add observer, we can do, get automatic cancellation of this whole actor as well. Finally, we define another extension function on the lifecycle owner called when clicking, which takes a view and a loading function. And all that does is create this loading channel that we just saw. Creates a loading channel, passes in itself, it's the lifecycle of this lifecycle owner, the view that we're calling this on, and the loading function. And the final this use of this DSL would be like this. When clicking, passing in the button, do your background operation, and then show it. So this will prevent the coroutine from launching multiple load tweets call. So 
until the show tweets has returned and displayed the result, it it's won't launch anything more. Does this replace RxJava? That's a common question. No, absolutely not. It actually complements RxJava in many ways. You can write these nice DSLs and you can do really complex operations in the background so that anyone using your API would have a much easier time doing that. Uh, and also, if you go to the coroutines uh, page on GitHub, you see that there's a bunch of extra libraries here. There is a reactive library. So they have made extensions on RxJava with coroutines. So they can work well together. So someone who, who's writing a really complex Rx chain can then hide the complexity of using that thing to, in a nice DSL like this. Jake Wharton also wrote an adapter for this, for retrofit. Basically, it just returns you a deferred, and then you can use that one in, in a coroutine. So the interesting thing here is if you, you create a, a, use this retrofit adapter, then you can use that together with uh, the DSL I just showed you, because the DSL I showed you with a then function, that is happening on a deferred object. So you can do your retrofit object, call the get user, and then display it. OK. How do you use it? How do you start getting uses? Well, you need to add your dependencies in Gradle. Also, coroutines are still just in experimental state. They, uh, so you need to enable that. Kotlin experimental coroutines enable. So this is what you need to get started. OK, I'm getting to the end. There's a bunch of resources to read for this. So you go to GitHub, and everything is there, basically. Uh, the two links I have below the first one there are really good articles to, get, to read to get started on this. Uh, the Coroutines Guide UI explains how to use actors to do this throttling I did. Uh, and the first one there explains all the basic concepts of all, all the different coroutine builders. Uh, I also wrote, um, well, you have a link to Jake Wharton's retrofit adapter, and I also wrote a blog post a while ago about this uh, that can work, that ex explains half of what I explained today. Uh, and there is also the GitHub project for that thing there. Now, I finished with 17 minutes left. That's amazing. Thank you very much for listening, and I think we have time for questions. First question. What are I? What are the performance between using several coroutine and using several thread? Uh, what's, the, what's the performance? So uh, theoretically, there shouldn't be a difference. Like the, you're still running on a thread somewhere. So it's more about how many coroutines you do because there's memory allocation and stuff happening. Uh, but in our case, for Android developers, we won't be launching like a thousand coroutines. The nice thing is, you could easily launch a hundred thousand coroutines on Android. And that runs fine, but you can't launch 100,000 threads. So it's more lightweight than threads in that way. Um, I heard people say that their performance got a little bit worse when using coroutines. It might be because it's still in experimental state and there's something there that they need to optimize. But overall, there shouldn't be a difference in performance. Yeah, hope that answers. Any question there? Oh, yeah, okay, so the question was, how fast does cancel cancel? Uh, <laughs> fast? <laughs> no, no it's, uh, it's, it, it's like RxJava's dispose. You, you're, you're guaranteed to not get that call to whatever. If you, if you do what I did there, you have an await. The, the await, when it gets resumed, it will throw an exception. So you don't risk any race condition in that way. I think that's what you're asking. Uh, right, you don't, yeah. Thank you, Falcon. Uh, can we use uh, dependency injection to inject the jobs and then start them lazily? Can you use dependency injection? I don't see why, but that seems scary. <laughs> Please try it and let me know how it works. Uh, th theoretically, you could have like dagger 
produce uh, uh, something deferred, and then you call a wait on that one. But then you need to think about it as scoped in the proper way and stuff. So, yeah, yeah no, I don't see a problem. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I will be here. Oh. Yeah. I'll I'll be here for the rest of the